Let us pray. Holy and majestic God, you created human life and provided your divine wisdom and guidance, and then you provided your Son that we might follow his example for our lives and the lives of others. May we be filled with your most Holy Spirit so that we might be all that you intended us to be as we pray the, pray the meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth might be pleasing and acceptable to you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Of all the Gospels, Mark's Gospel is the one that truly makes the disciples look clueless. The other, the other, Matthew and Luke are not quite as bad, and John's pretty good about it. But Mark, Mark really, really emphasizes the fact that the disciples just didn't get it. And for us, that's pretty good news, because if the disciples didn't get it, and they were with Jesus, then when we don't get it, it doesn't seem quite as bad, does it? We don't always understand the Bible either. We don't always, we, we know that we're supposed to love others, right? But we don't necessarily always get it either, either, that we really are supposed to love people, especially when they're different from us. And just like the disciples, we don't always understand Jesus' teachings. So we have to reflect on it, think about it, talk about it, hear a sermon, go to Bible study, go to subject classes to learn. So Mark tries to help us in today's scripture. He gives us three very interesting contrasts for us to consider. Now the first is where he contrasts knowledge with ignorance. And this has to do with the question of who do people say that I am? And then the second contrast is where he looks at God or the Son of Man contrasted with Satan or humans? And this is where we're looking at divine things truly being over human things. And the third is where he contrasts gaining or saving your life with losing it. With losing it. And this is where he pushes us to sacrifice one's life for God. So our first one our first contrast, knowledge with knowledge contrasted with ignorance, or the ability to recognize Jesus as the Messiah, is, is looked at by Mark where the Messiah, the term Messiah, Jewish term Messiah, means the anointed one. And the anointed one was not necessarily divine. It was not necessarily considered God. Think about it. David was, in fact, considered the Messiah because he was anointed by Samuel, who was, who was directed uh, and was directed by God to anoint Samuel, to, or to anoint David, to be king, to be the Jewish king. He was the anointed one, and that's exactly what the Messiah or the Christ means. The Christ is, of course, Greek. Messiah is in Hebrew. So David is considered Messiah. And in fact, most of the, most of the uh, Caesars, the, the, the Roman, Roman emperors, considered themselves messiahs as well because they felt that they were anointed by God as well to be the emperor of the Roman Empire. Now here we see where not everyone understands exactly who Jesus is. Some consider him the fact the messiah. Others consider him John the Baptist, reborn. Or Elijah, reborn. Or, the pro or just a simple prophet of God. So it's, there's a whole lot of different perspectives here of who Jesus really is. Back even back in the day. Yet when Jesus calms a storm, the disciples around him said, Who then is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. He's called a teacher. A good teacher, in fact. He is called, as, as Izzy reminded us, he was, he's a healer. He performed miracles. And he took care of people. He did exorcisms. He rid of people of demons. And healed their mental and physical ailments. And yet he calls himself the Son of Man. Not the Son of God. He calls himself the Son of Man, who has the authority to forgive sins and to 
to be Lord of the Sabbath. Now that's a lot to consider when you're trying to figure out who Jesus really is. And even in today, 2,000 years later, we still have different denominations and different faiths still trying to figure out who Jesus is. Some believe him to be a prophet, a great prophet. In fact, that's exactly what Islam, Islam believes him to be a great prophet. The Jews believe him to be a prophet as well, but not the Messiah. And Christians of all different denominations look at Jesus in different, different ways. But Jesus asked the most important question of all. No matter what everyone else is thinking, who do you, you, who do you say that I am? Now, Peter correctly identifies him as the Messiah, the anointed one of God, but just when we think Peter has got this, this knowledge, and he has kind of succeeded with having knowledge over ignorance, Peter turns around and rebukes Jesus for suggesting that he will suffer at the hands of the elders and be killed. And here we come into our second contrast, which is the Son of God, or the Son of Man and God, contrasted with Satan and human beings. That simply being divine thinking over human thinking. Now, Peter, you see, misses. He completely misses the whole thing about being raised in three days. And this is an important aspect because you have to remember that the Sadducees in Jesus' day did not believe in resurrection at all. When you die, you die. But the Pharisees did. The Pharisees believed that there was a resurrection. So Jesus coming and saying he can not only forgive sins, but he's Lord of the Sabbath, but also we know that the whole reason that he is going to be rejected and killed is so that he can bring about the death of death. Victory over death. In fact, that eternal life, he brings it to the forefront to see that we in fact have this wonderful gift from God of eternal life. You see, Peter, unfortunately, is viewing Jesus from a Jewish understanding of the Messiah, not of a divine one. His approach to Christ is from a human understanding where he desperately needs a divine wisdom for salvation. We have to remember that they believe that Peter is believing in the Messiah like David. David was a warrior king, anointed by God to rule the Jewish state. And they believe Jesus to be the Messiah who is going to free them from the oppressions of the Roman Empire. And in fact, that's not what he's come to do. That's not what he's come to do at all. Peter lacks an understanding and clearly shows that he doesn't understand Jesus' identity nor his mission. Jesus is divine, and his mission is to show what true love for God and for humanity is by sacrificing himself. And he says, if you want to follow Jesus, you've got to pick up your cross, and you've got to follow him. And is there any, is there any, you know, any, any wonder why the cross has two bars? One that goes from earth to God in heaven, and one that goes across, that is across the aisle, meaning that is amongst human beings. So we have a relationship with God, and we have a relationship with each other. The cross. The cross that Christ hangs on for us. So that we can have a relationship with God and with each other. And even think about the Ten Commandments. Out of the Ten Commandments, the first four are between us and God. The next six are between each other. The Ten Commandments, look at them, go home and read them. Six of the Ten Commandments has to do with how we deal with one another. Four deal with how we deal with God. Because to save your life here on earth, which is a gift, a gift from God means co-crucifixion with Christ and self-denial. When you hold on to life as if it was your property, something that you possess, then you truly are thinking from a human perspective and not with divine wisdom. 
Salvation or saving your life is giving your life to God. Just as Christ gave his life for you. Giving yourself to God in the here and now on this earth as well as giving yourself over to God in heaven. So how does this, these contrasts that Mark so brutally points out to us truly affect us on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, when we, use the, when we use the knowledge God gives us through the Bible and through Christ's teachings, we understand Christ's identity as truly divine and truly human. And we also understand his mission for our lives, to give us purpose and meaning, to give us forgiveness, to give us eternal life, hope that death is not the final chapter of a life. And then we can truly understand and appreciate that gift, that gift of salvation, the saving of our lives here on earth as well as in heaven. Because... When we give ourselves to God, we are to give each, ourselves to each other. We are to take care of one another. You see, discipleship, discipleship, understanding Jesus as our prototype, understanding that Christ was not only 100% human, but he was also 100% divine. And what are we? What are we? We are called the children of who? God. Children of God. What was Christ? The Son of what? Son of God. If we have the Holy Spirit within us, what are we? 100% human and? Divine. 100% divine. We have the Holy Spirit within us. Jesus is the prototype. He is our example, our model. Christ is telling us, this is the power that you have within your own self. I come here to show you you can be in relationship with your God, the one that created all life. You can be in relationship with one another and learn how to love each other. I am the example. I am the model. God has sent me to show you that you have the capability of loving each other. No longer divided. No longer arguing but being in relationship with God and being in relationship with each other being the most important thing in your life. Giving of yourself to God. Now, if you don't like the condition of our world right now and the condition that it's in, then use the divine knowledge that Peter finally gets and that God gives you. Understand Christ's identity and Christ's mission in your life. And then save yourself. Save yourself through your belief. And also save yourself from self-righteousness, selfishness, and self-centeredness of this world by putting and truly understanding what salvation is all about. By truly giving yourself to God.